morning, everybody. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> um, we had a, a few delays this morning. Um, maybe you, you heard before our, our little boy is a bit sick and, and has some fever. So we had to attend to him and it caused a few things to, to be um, a bit later than usual. So I just want to see who's watching. And um, okay, it seems like it's soft. Is it better now? Does it sound better now? Hope so. All right. Okay, so I want to speak about healing today. And um, morning, Erica. Morning, my wife in the house. <laughs> so um, I want to say a few things before we start reading. And um, there's a few misconceptions that people have about God and the nature of God and about healing and about God's will to answer prayer, about God's will to heal. Um, and we're going to look at a few scriptures. Um, so I want to make a few statements first. Uh, it is always God's will to heal. It is never God's will for anyone to be sick. It is always God's will to heal everyone. It's never God's will to skip someone. Uh, God has absolutely no plan in your sickness. God has absolutely no uh, will in sickness. He's got no hand in your sickness. He's got no hand in death. Um, it is not his will. It is not his purpose. His purpose is life and his purpose is healing. His purpose is never for you to experience sickness. And when you have these things settled in your heart, you can boldly walk in the truth and see the sick healed. If you are wondering about these things, if you're wondering if the sickness is God's will, then um, you will not have boldness because you never know if you are in God's will or not. Uh, you never know if you might be going against God's will because maybe this sickness was sent by God to teach someone something or something. Hey, sickness is not our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Word is our teacher. Sickness is a curse. So from the beginning, you can check it out right through the Bible. So right in the beginning, um, right there in Genesis... God warned Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, he said, for in that day you will die. So he warned them against death. Death was not his plan for Adam and Eve. Uh, death was not God's heart. Now, we know that death came into the world through sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Sin entered into the world and death through sin. Sin was not God's plan for man. Therefore, death was not God's plan for man. Because uh, uh, death entered into the world through sin. Death didn't enter into the world through God. Uh, so the, the door to death coming into the world is sin. Now, Jesus wanted us to experience life. So in John chapter 10, he said, the thief comes for to steal and kill and destroy. That thief is the knowledge of good and evil. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil bringing death. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil bringing the knowledge of sin that causes death. And um, God wanted us to have life. He says, the thief comes for to steal and kill and destroy but I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance and have it until it overflows. So abundant life does not include sickness. Abundant life does not include death. Abundant life is life, divine health, and healing. So any manifestation of a sickness is a manifestation of death. Any sickness has this one goal, ultimately. If there's no immune response, any sickness has one goal, and that is to kill you. If you have zero immune response, the common cold could kill you, uh, will kill you if there's no immune response. Um, the, the slightest sickness can cause people 
to, um, to die if there's no immune response. So uh, God's heart, even in biology, was to build in an immune response so that we could be healed. God does not want anyone to be sick. So even in this time of this, um, this virus pandemic, uh, it is not God's will that this virus enter the world. God has nothing to do with it. He has nothing to do with all the, those tens of thousands of people that died. It is not him. It's got nothing to do with him. So um, one, some of the first things that I want you to, to uh, settle in your heart is this, that um, God has nothing to do with sickness. Uh, and just as much as God has nothing to do with sin, and just as much as God has nothing to do with death. It is not who he is, and it is not what he brings. He came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Okay, right. So um, if sickness was from God, then you would go against the will of God if you would um, go to the doctor. If you would take medication to become better and sickness was your teacher sent from God to teach you, then you are rebellious against God's will if God sent you the sickness. Now, even in the law, uh, you can see there in Deuteronomy 28, uh, it speaks of blessings and curses. There's other scriptures, but this one is so evident. Uh, it says, if you obey everything written in the book of the law, then you shall be blessed in a city, blessed in the field, blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed shall be your bread basket and your kneading trowel, and blessed shall be the fruit of your body, and blessed, 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 15 verses. And then it says, but if you do not abide by everything written in the book of the law, then you shall be cursed in the city, cursed in the field, cursed coming in, cursed going out. Cursed, cursed, cursed. And then it says, and all the sicknesses that is not even mentioned in this book will cleave to you. So sickness and death has from the beginning been part of the curses column. It's never been part of the blessing column. A sickness is not a blessing in disguise. A sickness is a curse. A sickness is your enemy. 1 Corinthians 15 says, the last enemy to be conquered is death. Death is not your friend. Death is an enemy. And um, a lot of people kind of exalt death and worship death and praise death. But death is not your savior. People think, oh, they're in a better place now when they died. Well, if they believed, they are with Christ. But even so, God wants us to live and not die. Even so, God wants us to live and receive the manifestation of the Spirit that is from God, from the unseen. God's heart is, let your kingdom come in earth that is in heaven. He wants what is in the unseen where he is to come here. He doesn't want us from here to, for our bodies to die and so that our spirits would only remain with him. Uh, we, he wants us to be alive and well and healthy and filled with his spirit and filled with his authority and power so that we can reign on this earth in the kingdom of God. And so that by the power of God, we can minister healing to all who are sick. God wants to banish sickness from this earth. God wants to destroy all sickness. God wants to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. That's the uh, command he gave in and Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, to the disciples, he says, Go, preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Okay, and he gave them authority to do that. What is authority? Authority is God's uh, power, his will, his, um, his word being put into action through someone else. Okay, so uh, I've, I've explained this before. Um, in a kingdom, there's a king and a king gives commands, but the subjects of the king go and do the commands. The king doesn't do everything. The king gives the order for everything to be done. 
Okay, so this concept um, is so foreign for a lot of theologians because they're doing nothing. Um, a king, if you just take a normal king in a normal uh, worldly kingdom, the king doesn't build the road. But people will attribute the road being built to the king. Oh, in that king's reign, he built these roads, and he built those walls, and he built the city. But he didn't build the city. He didn't lay the bricks and mortar. He sat there on the throne, and he said, and then everyone in the kingdom jumped to attention, and the moment he said it, they ran out and they built the road. They ran out and they built the wall. They ran out and they built the city. So he has the wisdom and the authority to say something which empowers the people to go and do what he says. They don't do their own will. They do the command of the king. That's how a kingdom functions. But we have been so brainwashed with democracy that we think it's the democracy of God and not the kingdom of God so we all come together and we we decide God must heal him hey God sent you to heal him so um, God God is not the one uh, holding back the healing the people are the ones holding back the healing because he gave command and we need to be obedient which brings me to sovereignty uh, sovereignty is it's about the authority of the king. If you recognize the authority of the king, and if you're obedient to the king, you will, with the authority of the king and the power of the king, do the command of the king. And um, in a normal kingdom, if a king gave a command, the whole force of the kingdom is behind it, and whoever has the authority to execute the command has the full force of the legal system, the full force of the executive branch to, uh, to do the command. And if anyone doesn't uh, stand a, uh, in agreement with that command, if, everyone, if, if someone doesn't want to work along with it, they're in rebellion to the king. And that doesn't mean that um, the king isn't uh, sovereign anymore. The king is the sovereign, and his word is above contestation. So his word is the the last say, is the highest authority. So um, that means that when the king speaks, those who are disobedient are in rebellion. So that doesn't make the king less sovereign. That makes the subject less obedient. Okay, so we need to get these concepts right in our minds if we want the sick to be healed. If we want the sick to be healed in our lives, we need to first understand it's not God's will that the sick are, are sick in the first place. Secondly, it's God's will that they will be healed and that they will all be healed. Okay, thirdly, it's God's will to use you to heal the sick. And he gave you power and authority, and he sent you out to go and heal the sick. So we, if Jesus is Lord, and if Jesus is King, our response to his command is, yes, Lord, or yes, my King. So he's either Lord, and it's yes, Lord, or he's not Lord, and it's no Lord. So uh, we need to be doing what the King says. So if if we would just start reacting start doing what the word of the king says we should do we will receive his power and we will see the results that he uh, wants he we will see his nature and his authority being uh, uh, manifested in this earth so we can we can look to a few um scriptures i want to go to luke chapter 4 now i want you to understand jesus is jesus is king he's king of the universe he's not just some guy jesus is king and jesus being king um, moves with the power and with the authority of the holy spirit with the power and with the authority of the father he was completely subject to the father he was obedient unto death he said not my will but your will be done 
Okay, so we are very nice and religious, and if, we, if there's some suffering, we say, oh, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Hey, who said the suffering was God's will? The suffering was God's will for Jesus. He suffered in our place so that we can live. The suffering is not yours to bear. It was his to bear. So now he's, he gives a command to us in the New Testament, and he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So we get to do the nice stuff. And these signs will follow them that believe they will, uh, you know, cast out demons and they will t- take up serpents and it will not hurt them and they will drink deadly things and it will not hurt them. That's Mark chapter 15 um, or Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And so, so there's all these things and he gives us power and authority to do it. And they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So, it, but we don't want to say, oh Lord, your will be done and not my will. <laughs> so how do we know what his will is? He said it. He gave a command. Don't you think it's the command of the king? Uh, the command of the king is the will of the king. So uh, we need to think less and do more. We need to reason less and hear what he says and just react and do it. It's so simple. You will see the sick healed when you lay your hands on them. Jesus said in John chapter 5, I do not do my own will. I only do what I see my father doing. I do not say, my message is not of myself. I only say what my father says. Do you see there? Completely yielded, completely surrendered to the father's authority. So the father was the last absolute authority in his life. And he was absolutely obedient in all things to the Father. So what was the result of Jesus' absolute obedience to the Father? Everywhere he went, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he cleansed the lepers, he opened blind eyes, he opened the deaf ears. Signs, wonders, miracles. Okay? Right, so... Um, let's go to Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit. For during 40 days in the wilderness, where he was tempted and tried and tested exceedingly by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were completed, he was hungry. Okay, so he went to the wilderness. Um, in the wilderness, uh, I'm not going to touch on the subject. Don't worry. It's going to be take too long. Okay, so he was hungry. He was tempted in the wilderness, tempted of the devil. So he was in a state of weakness. Verse 3, then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, order this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. Jesus replied to him, it is written, man shall not live and be sustained by bread alone, but by every word and expression of God. Then the devil took him up to the high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the habitable world in a moment of time, in the twinkling of an eye. And he said to them, to him, to you will I give this power and authority and the glory. You see there how uh, the devil lures him into obedience he wants him to come under his power and authority okay to you i will give all this power and authority and their glory all their magnificence excellence and preeminence dignity and grace for it has been turned over to me who turned it over to him adam did (laughs) but adam uh, was disobedient to god so it actually still belongs to god and i give it to whomever i will Liar. Verse 7. Therefore, if you will do homage to and worship me just once, it shall all be yours. And Jesus replied to him, Get behind me, Satan. It is written, You shall do homage to and worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then he took him to Jerusalem and sent him, uh, uh, set him on on a gable of the temple and, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down from here, for it is written, He will give his angels charge over you to guard and watch over you closely and carefully. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus replied to him, the scripture says, you see, it is written, the scripture says, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. 
And when the devil had ended um, every temptation, he temporarily left him until another more opportune and favorable, favorable time. So that more opportune and favorable time was when Jesus was hanging on that cross and went out of the mouth of the one robber and out of the mouth of the, the, this, this priest and the Pharisees that was crucifying him. He tempted him. If you are the son of God, come down from that cross. Okay. So verse 14, then Jesus went back full of and under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the important part. Into Galilee. And the fame of him spread through the whole region, region about him. And he himself conducted a course of teaching in their synagogues, being recognized and honored and praised by all. So he came to Nazareth. Oh, so they know him from a small boy. This is now a different story. Where he had been brought up and he entered the synagogue as was his custom on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And now he was under the control of the Holy Spirit doing this. Now he says, And there was handed to him the roll of the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the unrolled book and found the place where it was written, it's Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, the Messiah, the anointed one, to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce the release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity, to proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation, the, the free favors of God profusely abound. Then he rolled up the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were gazing attentively at him. And he began to speak to them. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled while you are present and hearing. What boldness <laughs> to say that. He basically told them in his hometown, listen, I'm the Christ. <laughs> Under the control of the Holy Spirit, he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he has anointed me. Okay, what has he anointed Jesus for? To preach the gospel. So you don't preach the gospel if you're not anointed. Then you sit down and you keep your mouth shut. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Okay. So you will not see the release of the captives. And you will not see recovery of sight to the blind if the anointing is not there. So... It, you can have courses of deliverance all you want. If the anointing is not there, they will not be free. You will just keep them in bondage to yourself so that you can have your significance trip. Okay? So we are not into that. We have to operate by the anointing. And we have to submit to the will of the Father, the will of God. And recovery of sight to the blind. So... With the anointing, the blind see. Without the anointing, the blind will not see. To send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, broken down by calamity. Okay, so those who are oppressed is a very broad thing. In Acts chapter 10 verse 38, Jesus spoke, uh, um, Peter spoke, and he, he preached Jesus to the house of Cornelius. And, he's, and he preached this, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This, this moment, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So the healing came to the oppressed, okay? Uh, healing all who oppressed with, with the devil because God was with him. All right. To proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. Then he rolled up the book and gave it back. So he, he just took the scripture under the anointing. He said, hey, this is what I was sent for. And I have the authority, I have the power, I have the mandate from God to do this. Basically, it just said, bring the sick. Okay? I am he. All right. So, he wasn't there to be the big shot. He was there to represent the Father. And that's a big thing we need to understand when we minister healing. It's not about being seen by people. Ooh, that guy can heal the sick. Ooh, that guy can raise the dead. No, it's about 
representing the Father. It's about representing Jesus. It's about being obedient and being bold in what he said. When you start going for miracles, not everyone will be as excited about it as you are. Not everyone will be as, uh, as open to it as you are. Okay, you will get some resistance. You will lose some, some favor with some family members. You will lose some favor with some old friends that knew you from when you were small, you know, like <laughs> from when you were young. And they stand, they'll stand up and say, you, you make no sense. How can you say these things? They will stand up and say, you're wasting your talents because you have intellect to become uh, this and this and this. But now you're wasting it all on this. Listen, not everyone will understand when God speaks to you. But being in the kingdom means this. You never, ever look back. Okay? No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Okay? So that means whoever criticizes you qualifies themselves as carnal because Galatians chapter 4 says the son of the slave woman um, as it was then it is also now the son of the slave woman will always persecute the son of the free those who are carnal the sand of the sea the born out of bondage will always persecute those born from the spirit born out of virtue of the, of the promise. Okay, so uh, if you get the resistance, uh, don't crumble up and go lay in a corner. It is to be expected. So you keep your ears and your eyes focused on Jesus. And whatever he says to you, you do. Whatever he, he, he shows you, you do. And you say, okay? And um, out of obedience and out of humility, out of surrendered life a surrendered life living for an audience of one living for the approval of one and that is your king jesus from there when you move out of that fellowship i mean every move you make is out of fellowship when you when you uh, minister out of fellowship with him the sick will get healed the blind will see the deaf will hear so in this ministry we've seen the deaf ear, we've seen the blind see, we've seen the lame walk, we've seen people uh, walk away from crutches, we've seen people get up out of wheelchairs, we've seen people receive back their sight having been completely blind, we've seen people's ears opening up, hearing, we've seen people healed of cancer, we've seen people healed of HIV, uh, people that was at the brink of death, dying of AIDS, is now working. Okay, they, they're up and about, they're alive, they are fine, They've, they were healed. Okay, so uh, why does these things happen? Is it because we are good? No, it is because Jesus is good. And because we value his word above the word of tradition, we value his word above the opinions of people, we value his word even above the report of reality. Okay, so if reality says this guy is going to be sick and there's no cure, but the word says go heal the sick, we believe the word and we lay hands on the sick and we see the sick getting healed. Not all of them yet. Why not? Maybe I'm not yielded completely. So is it God not wanting to heal that person? No, it's always God's will for every person to be healed. So why isn't every person healed? Because the one ministering the healing is not totally yielded to him. He's not completely obedient, but we are growing in it. We start somewhere. We start by just laying on our hands. We pray for a headache. We pray for whatever is in front of us, back pains to go and ankle pains to go. And then we start uh, stirring ourselves for uh, prophetic stuff. And we, we start to, by word of knowledge, call out all kinds of different ailments and sicknesses that people have. Even in, in everyday life at the, at the checkout counter, at the supermarket or uh, wherever, standing in a queue somewhere or whatever, the, the petrol attendant. Uh, you can you can give a, a word of knowledge and bring healing to a person, okay? And those things happen when you are fully yielded and controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. 
to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to raise the dead. Okay? So in our ministry, I think it's about four now, if I'm counting correctly, dead people that was raised. One was raised by me laying my hands on a person and three others, other people in the ministry. Okay? So in, in our church. So um, it is not... It is not far-fetched. It is testimonies that we have its reality today. Okay? So um, what I'm saying is that when we, when we value the Word of God above the reality, uh, when we say, yes, Lord, we will go, we will start seeing more and more results. Okay? So um, it is not about taking... The being in the limelight, or, or no, it's about representing Jesus. Um, if there's one thing that causes offense, it's the power of God. Power offends the religious. Talk of power offends the religious. <laughs> okay, so when you can heal the sick and you do it, they are offended because. For some reason, they don't believe you and they think it's some trick. Okay. So, uh, but the, the big thing that we need to get is that this is meant for every believer. It is not for the super duper GTI 16 valve with double exhaust pipe Christians and two turbos. It's, it's not for the super Christians. It's for you. You can heal the sick. You can raise the dead. You can open up deaf ears. You can open up the blind eyes. Because of Jesus that's inside you. Start when you hear his voice to simply act. Okay? So it's more about obedience that brings his power to action in our lives. Yielding obedience. Hear me right. Okay? It's not, oh, you've been disobedient, now God is going to punish you. So forget that concept of obedience. Obedience is faith in Jesus, faith. Believe his word and do it, okay? So be doers of the word. So um, don't be afraid of failing. Be more afraid of not starting. Because if you don't start, you will 100% have no healing. But if you start laying your hands on the sick, at least there's a chance for someone to get healed. I guarantee you, the more you start acting and start stepping out and doing some things in, in, in laying hands on the sick, the more results you will get, okay? Because faith is an action. James chapter 3 says, faith without works is dead. So we need to act. We need to do something. And the moment you step out and you act on the word, the power is there to heal them. The first time I ever saw someone healed was my grandmother's sister, okay? Uh, the, the sister to, um, to some really s spiritual people. She, she's known uh, signs and wonders, but she had a knee problem, and she, she, couldn't, uh, she couldn't walk, and she, was re she really had pain. And we were on the farm, and I was so afraid. I was so afraid of the opinion of everybody. And I was so afraid of the criticism of everyone. So I took her by the hand and I, I drew her into the pantry. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. Okay? And she was really open to it. Okay? And I prayed for her. And I didn't really believe her when she said it was better. <laughs> so I think it was about two years ago or so. Um, I visited her, and she said, I remember that day when you prayed for me, and my knee is still healed. Now, that was years ago. That was, I think that was maybe in 2003. So that was years ago, okay? And her knee was, was still healed. Okay, so, so I, I want to encourage you, even if you have, if you feel everything is against you, even if you feel I am so unqualified, just step out. Because in the action of obedience, the authority of the one that sent you is released. When you never get to that point of doing it, you will never see that authority being exerted. You are the messenger. You are the one that was sent from him 
to do something, a direct command. So when we act, it's his power that's made available to heal the sick. Luckily, he didn't give up the healing part to us. He just gave the going part to us. So we just put our hands on the sick and he will heal him. We need to get this. He always wants to heal the sick. He always wants to heal everyone present. There is no circumstances in which God allows sickness. There is no circumstances in which sickness is the will of God. Sickness is a curse. Death is a curse. The life is the blessing that was promised by, uh, by the Holy Spirit, promised to Abraham. Life is the, the ultimate goal of the preaching of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him might not perish and have eternal everlasting life. Okay, so there's one more scripture I want to read. There's so much we can say about this, but we're going to continue for a few sessions on, on healing. So, um, so tomorrow morning we'll speak about uh, Isaiah 53 and so on. Healing is part of the cross, part of the atoning sacrifice. All right. So uh, John chapter 14, Jesus said, verse 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? What I am telling you, I do not say of my own authority. Of my own accord, but the Father who lives continually in me does his works and his own miracles and deeds of power. So you say and do. What do you say? The gospel. What do you do? Signs, wonders, and miracles. All right? That's what we are anointed for. Verse 11 Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the very works themselves. If you cannot trust me, at least let these works that I do in my Father's name convince you. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, he will himself be able to do the things that I do, and he will do even greater things than these because. I go to my Father. Did you hear this? If anyone believes in me, okay, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. He says, but if anyone steadfastly believes in me, not only will he himself experience life, but he will be able to do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. Jesus is ready to do greater works through you than he did on earth before he died on the cross. We should stop limiting God. We should stop holding God back by our fear of the opinions of people and by our fear of persecution or fear of whatever. Get over yourself. When we act on what he says when we say what he says his authority and his power is released and we get to see the effect of the kingdom of god on this earth signs and wonders and miracles signs and wonders and miracles is not an academic rational thought signs and wonders and miracles is an execution of power from the king we need to stop reasoning and we need to start doing. May you experience power. May you experience the blessing of God. May you know that you know that you know that he wants to use you to heal the sick. And that it is always God's will to heal every person. Awesome. Be blessed. And we'll speak again tomorrow. Amen.